So today we will commence with our first hadith from the 40 hadith collection of Imam Nawawi. Last week we completed our introduction. So before we even do start with the first hadith, we'll talk about the importance of ikhlas from the Quran and Sunnah. Allah Azza wa Jalla says in his book, A'uzu billahi minash shaytani rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِسُونَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَفَاءَ وَيُقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَذَلِكَ دِينُ الْقَيْمَةِ Surah Bayina verse 5 Translation And they were not commanded except to worship Allah being sincere to him in religion inclining to truth and to establish prayer and to give zakah and that is the correct religion So this verse is regarding sincerity that not only we worship Allah, we should also have sincerity. The second verse, Allah Ta'ala says, لَن يَنَالَ اللَّهَ لُحُومُهَا وَلَا دِمَاؤُهَا وَلَكِنْ يَنَالُهُ التَّقْوَى مِنْكُمْ Surah Hajj verse 37, translation, Neither the meat nor, nor blood reaches Allah, rather it is your piety that reaches Him. So when we make qurbani, when we make the sacrifice of the animal, the animal doesn't go to Allah. It is our deed, it is our good intention that goes to Allah Azza wa Jalla. The third verse, قُلْ إِنْ تُخْفُوا مَا فِي صُدُورِكُمْ أَوْ تُبُدُوهُ يَعْلَمُهُ اللَّهِ Surah Ali Imran, verse 29. Translation, say, O Prophet, whether you conceal what is in your hearts or reveal it, it is known to Allah. So Allah Ta'ala knows about everything. Allah Ta'ala knows what's in our hearts. When we, are, when, we, when we do our actions, Allah knows what's our intention. So we should be sincere. In the hadith, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna Allah la yanghuru ila atsamikum wa la ila suarikum wa la kin yanghuru ila qulubikum wa amalikum. Sahih Muslim, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, On the Day of Judgment, Allah Ta'ala will not look at your bodies. He will not, be, he will not look at your appearances. Rather, he will be looking at your hearts and your actions. So what is um, regarded in the sight of Allah is your actions, which are accompanied by the right, in, which are accompanied by sincere intention. So the importance of niya, having the right intention is so important that in another hadith, Rasulullah Sallallahu says, Man hamma bi hasanatin falam ya'malha kutubat lahu hasana. Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever intends to do a good deed and he has not committed that good deed, even then, good deed will be written for him. So even if the person hasn't, even if the person have, has not done the action, but just by him making the intention, Allah Ta'ala will write down the reward for him. So this is the, this is the weight of having right intention. So it's not always that you have to do the action. Sometimes by having good intention and not being able to do the action, Allah Ta'ala will still write down the deeds for you. And one deed is multiplied by 700 times. So just by having a good in intention, many a times, you know, you want to contribute, you know, towards a um, charity foundation, but you don't have the enough money, but you have the intention for just for that intention, Allah Ta'ala will, will give you reward. Umar bin Khattar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu said, Afdalu al-a'mal ada'u maftaru allahu ta'ala wal war'u amma haram allahu ta'ala wa sidku al-niyya fi ma inda allahi ta'ala. Umar bin Khattar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu says, the best of the actions is that which, the best of the actions is to carry out that which Allah ta'ala has made compulsory and to refrain from that which Allah ta'ala has made forbidden and to have the right intention and to have sincere intention. <clears throat> Salim bin Abdullah radiallahu anhu sent a letter to Umar bin Abdul Aziz rahmatullah. He said, "Alam anna anna Allah Taala lil abdi ala qadri niya. Faman tamat niya tuhu tamma aun Allah Taala. Wa inna qasat nukisa bi qadri." So he says, the help of Allah Taala is based upon the intention of the person. So if the person had a complete intention, he was completely sincere, Allah Ta'ala's help will also be complete. And if he had any deficiency in his intention, then Allah Ta'ala's help will not be complete. Many of the Salaf have said, Rubba, many 
they said that many small actions, they become great because of the intention. So the action in itself may seem very small, but the intention makes it very great. And there are many actions, big actions. They become great because of the intention. They become small, the, the, the meaning the, the act, there are many big actions that because of the intention, because of the deficiency in the intention, the, the, the action becomes small. So big action, small actions become great because of the intention, when a person has sincere intention. And on the other hand, big actions, they become small because if there, if there is any deficiency in the niyyah. First slide. This is hadith, our first hadith. An Amir al Mu'minin Abi Hafs Umar ibn al Khattab radi Allah ta'ala anhu qala sami'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul inma al a'malu bin niyyat wa inma li kulli imri'in ma nawa fa man kanat hijratu ila Allah wa rasulihi fa hijratu ila Allah wa rasulihi wa man kanat hijratuhu li dunya yusibuha wa imratin yunkihuha fa hijratuhu ila ma hajara ilayhi rahu al Bukhari wa Muslim is narrated on the authority of Amir Amir al Mu'minin Abu Hafs Umar ibn Khattab radi Allah ta'ala anhu who said I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, actions are judged according to the intention and each individual will have what he intended. Thus he whose migration was to Allah and his messenger, his migration is to Allah and his messenger. Uh, he whose migration was for some worldly thing that he may gain or for a wife he might, he might marry, his migration is to that for what he, for which he uh, migrated. So this is a very important hadith, a fundamental hadith. Imam Shafi and Imam Ahmad, rahimahumallah ta'ala, they said the hadith of intention constitutes one third of religious knowledge. So pointing towards the importance of the hadith, what did they say? The hadith of niyya, meaning in namal amalu bin niyyat, constitutes one third of religious knowledge. The logic behind the statement is that the actions of the servant involves the heart, tongue, and the limb. And intention is the action of the heart. So in this way, it becomes one third of the knowledge one acquires for any religious action. So when we commit any act, when we perform any action, then it consists of three things. The heart, tongue, and the limb. So heart is one third of it. So in that way, it becomes one third of knowledge. And each of them are needed, each of them are essential, but the most essential of all is the intention, the heart. Because without the intention, you're not going to be rewarded. The action will be deemed invalid. Abu Dawood Rahmatullah said, I looked into the Musnad hadith, a narration attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu with a complete chain, and it turned out to be 4,000 hadiths in total. I looked into 4,000 hadiths and I, re I realized that the foundation of the 4,000 hadiths is based upon four hadiths. So he was doing his research on Mustada hadiths, hadith narrations attributed to Prophet Sallallahu with a complete shape, and the number turned out to be 4,000. Then who, he, he digged into the meaning of the hadith and he came to the conclusion that the, the foundation of 4,000 hadiths is on four hadiths. The first one is the hadith of Nu'mar bin Bashir radiallahu ta'ala anhu al-halal ubayyin wal-haram ubayyin So the first hadith is al-halal ubayyin wal-haram ubayyin That which is lawful is clear and that which is unlawful is clear Hadith number one the second hadith is the hadith of Umar radiallahu ta'ala, which we are discussing, innama al-amalu bin niyyat. And the hadith of Abu Huray radiallahu ta'ala, anhu, inna Allah tayyibun la yaqbilu illa tayyiban, wa inna Allah amara al-mu'minina bima amara bihi al-mursaleen. Verily Allah ta'ala is pure and he does not accept anything except that which is pure. And Allah ta'ala certainly ordered the believers of that which he ordered the messengers. And the fourth hadith 
is min husni islam il mar'i tarkuhu ma la ya'ni indeed among the excellence of a person's islam is that he leaves what does not benefit him he said each hadith from the four hadith constitutes one fourth of knowledge so you can imagine the importance and weight of this hadith Scholars have recommended that any written book should begin with this hadith. Whenever a person, whenever author intends to write a book, he should start his book with this hadith. Inna malamalu bin niyat. To remind the students of knowledge that they should be seeking knowledge for the sake of Allah. As a reminder, Abdul Rahman bin Mahdi Ramatullah said, "It is necessary for everyone who intends to write a book that they begin with this hadith to remind the students of knowledge." to remind the students of having sincere intention imam bukhari rahmatullah started his book with this hadith so if you open sahih al bukhari you'll you'll find that this is the first hadith inna mal a'malu bin niyat so much important scholars have given to the uh, <clears throat> to sincere intention because the foundation of our action is based on our intentions as being rewarded or being punished is all based on our intentions so the scholars highlighted this point very much second slide now we will define the meaning of niyyah what niyyah means the arabic term niyyah it means in, in arabic tawajjuh al qalb nahwa al fi'l ibtigha'an li wajhi Allah wal qasd biha tamyiz al ibadah 'an al 'adah Translation, directing the heart towards an action, seeking only the pleasure of Allah Ta'ala. And the presence of intention is to differentiate ibadah from a'adah. So firstly, your action should be, um, intention is that thing that you direct your heart towards an action. You're playing salah. So the, the connection between, there should be a connection between your heart and the action of salah and you <clears throat> meaning when you do the action you should do it for the sake of allah then praying salah for the sake of allah so it's the heart of the action it's the action of the heart that you are diverting the heart towards the action and also to differentiate ibadah from ada so what this means is there are many actions which are habits which are habits normal habits eating drinking etc so now you by you making intention that very habit becomes an act of worship that very sleeping becomes an act of worship by making intention which we will um which we will discuss later on the benefits of making niya is firstly you are able to specify your action for example if you're making intention for zuhr salah then you're only praying zuhur you're not praying any other salah you're not praying asr salah you're not praying maghrib salah it specifies the other benefit is when you say habitual act if by you making a good intention that very act becomes an act of worship so that's what the definition is talking about certain acts they are habits they become act of worship by making niya <clears throat> hadith Actions are judged according to the intention. Commentary. The religious actions of the servant is dependent <clears throat> upon the intention. Whether the intention is a requirement for the validity of the action like salah, psalm, zakat, etc. Or the intention is not a requirement for the validity of the action but a requirement to receive reward like wudu, etc. In the former, without the intention the action is deemed invalid but in the latter the action of wudu is valid even without the intention but to receive the reward of performing wudu intention is required so actions are of two types one where in intention is a requirement for the validity of, of the action without intention your action will be will be deemed invalid for example salah saum etc so if you do this action carry out these actions without um, sincere intention your action will be invalid. If you do not make the intention of salah, for example, for praying salah, you don't make the intention of which salah you're praying, it will be deemed invalid. Yet there are other actions 
that niya is not a condition for its validity, but it's a condition to receive reward. For example, wudu. So if someone, you don't need intention for wudu. For your wudu to be valid, you don't need intention. Even without intention, if you do wudu, your wudu will be valid. But to receive the reward, you need to have niya. For example, Ya Allah, I'm performing wudu for your sake and to purify myself and to wish and to worship you. So this this ada becomes what ibadah. You get you, you will receive reward. This is the meaning. Actions associated with intention is of two types. Actions in which intention is a requirement for its validity, like salah, saum, zakah, hajj, etc. Actions in which intention transform a hab transforms a habit to act of worship, like eating, drinking, sleeping, exercising, etc. For example, a person eats with the intention to gain strength so that he could worship Allah. In this case, the habit of eating becomes an act of worship and entitled to receive rewards. Hadith. And each individual will have what he intended. Commentary. If someone performed a good action, like giving charity with the right intention, then he will be reward, rewarded by Allah. And if he did it for any other motive, like to gain name and fame, then he will achieve his name and fame, but will not be rewarded for giving charity and will be punished for it instead. So a servant being rewarded or being punished is pending on his intention. Next slide. Hadith, thus he whose migration was to Allah and his messenger, his migration is to Allah and his messenger. But he whose migration was for some worldly thing he might gain, or for a wife he might marry, his migration is to that for which he migrated. Commentary. In this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ uses the example Hijra, which was a great obligation during the Prophet's time, and those who migrated were greatly rewarded. So the Prophet Sallallahu is cautioning his followers to have the right intention in good deeds and not to spoil it with any other intention that is of worldly interest. As uh, this reward is very inferior and significant compared to the rewards of the hereafter. So the Hijra, which was which was made obligatory when the oppression when the oppression became unbearable Allah Ta'ala allowed and permitted the people to migrate was it was Habsha and then towards Medina so this was a, such a <clears throat> such a great deed that those from the Sahaba who migrated you know with the intention that you know to, to preserve their deen to carry out the command of Allah, they got the full reward. But those who had any other intention, for example, for Tijara to get married, obviously, they were deprived from that reward. So this is not in here, the example of Hijra is used. You can apply it in all the good deeds. That you can spoil an act with so much reward, you can spoil it just by having the wrong intention or having any worldly motive. Next slide. Just before we conclude with the chapter, I'll be covering, I'll be, I'm touching upon some important um, details regarding Niya. So stay on the um, slide. The, the slide before, slide number four, slide, um, the, the last commentary that I did, just stay there. Okay, now there are three types of practices. Yeah, there are three types of practices. One is disobedience, the act which is sinful which goes against the commands of Allah. The other is Tua'at, the obedience of Allah. And the other is Mubahat, 
those which are things which are permissible habitual acts. So I'll be talking about their association with niyyah. What difference can niyyah make in these three types of actions? Ma'asiyya, ta'a, and mubahat. It's not mentioned in the slide. I didn't include it in the slide. It's just from my side. You can note down later on. So if a act is sinful by you making good intention, that act will never become virtuous. A sinful act, if it's associated with a good intention, that very sinful act will never become an act of obedience, will never become a, um, a virtuous act. For example, a person with haram money, he purchases a masjid, he donates that money to the masjid. Now he'll never re receive reward for that. So you can see disobedience is associated with good intention. So masriya, disobedience, would remain disobedience. A person, he has money, but the money is haram, it's from a haram source, but what was his good intention? That he wants to give money to the masjid. So this will never, so this is the point. So one should be very careful. Many a times when people have interest money, etc., you know, they don't know where to use it. So you have to know where you can use it, you have to know, and, and you have to know where you can't use it. So normally interest money, you know, you give it to poor people, you can give it to poor Muslims, you can give it to insignificant in, in things, but you cannot have the right intention. You cannot have sincere intention. You cannot have the intention to please Allah. You should be very careful. Because it is relevant, I am touching upon these points. Secondly, obedience associated with good intention. So that's obvious, obviously. There are some acts in which niya is a condition for, for, for the um, acceptance of the action. and for the multiplication of the action. So now, when it comes to ibadah, when it comes to obedience, virtuous deeds, you need, you need niya. And if you have, if you do an act of worship, not to please Allah, but to show, for showing off, then that becomes riya. And riya is a major sin, it's a grave sin. So in act of worship, you need to have the right intention for its validity and to receive reward. Secondly, sometimes there's an opportunity that one very action, in one good action, you can, in one action, you can have several good intentions, scholars have mentioned. In one virtuous act, by you having multiple, you can have multiple good intentions just to multiply your reward. Example to this is, for example, you enter the masjid, you go to the masjid. So going, sitting in the masjid is a, is a, um, is a great act, is a very virtuous act. But now you can have several intentions to multiply your deeds. For example, before you enter into the masjid, you make the intention of atikaf, temporary halting in the masjid. So you make that intention, intention number one. Then you make the intention of, um, Ya Allah, I'm sitting in the masjid um, waiting for salah. That's another intention. I'm sitting in the masjid um, for your remembrance. So you, can, so you can see one virtuous act by having, you can increase your rewards by having multiple intentions. So from now onwards, we should be, we should be having this type of, type of attitude. Our main aim should be to increase our deeds. One action, how... We should make most of every action. Thirdly is mubahat, you know, per permissible acts, etc. So permiss habitual acts, necessities of life, by you having the right intention, you can transform, transform it into an act of deed. So example, perfume yourself, putting perfume on yourself, that's a habitual act, a necessity of life. But you can make this very habit into act of worship by having the niyyah of acting upon the sunnah of Rasulullah 
because Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was known to have uh, he you know a fond of perfume. He used to love perfume. He used to put lots of perfume. So if you have the intention that I'm I'm putting on perfume, Ya Allah, you know to act upon the Sunnah of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then that very act, very habit becomes an act of reward. If you also have the mas um, niya, um Ya Allah, I'm putting on perfume because I'm going to your masjid. I'm going to your circle of knowledge. So having respect for the environment, for the Islamic environment, you'll be rewarded. Also, if you have the intention of putting perfume, if your intention is for your nearby people are not, um, you are not troubling by you putting on perfume, you know, the people, you make the people comfortable. You know, if you have, for example, you know, in the hadith, it comes that, you know, people with bad smell, they shouldn't be going to the masjid because that gives difficulty to the nearby people, people who are around you, and it gives um, difficulty to the angels. So with bearing this in mind, if you put on perfume, you'll be rewarded. And insight into intention is, is nature. What is intention? So intention is the action of the heart. It is when your heart is inclined towards the action, towards achieving something. That's what intention is. When your heart is inclined towards achieving something which is beneficial, whether in present or in the future. Now, this intention is not in our choice, basically. So, meaning what this means, sometimes you can have the right intention and sometimes you cannot have the right intention. It's not in your control completely. It's depending on the situations. Sometimes you do a good deed, it's very easy to have the right intention. Sometimes it's not easy to have the right intention. So it's not under one's choice. But the one who can have sincere intention for good deeds is the person whose in heart is more inclined towards them. Someone whose heart is more inclined towards Deen, it is much more easier for that person to have the right intention. It's not going to be difficult for him. But as for the person who's a, who's, who's a worldly person, who is, um, who is tempted by the dunya, for that person to have the right intention is, is very difficult. So whatever I'm quoting, I'm quoting from the experts, you know, scholars of Tasawwuf. They've experimented everything and from their experience they are saying this. Scholars have said, when it comes to people making intention, there are three categories. One category, the person has sincere intention out of fear of Allah. The second category, the person has sincere intention <clears throat> out of hope, hope of receiving reward. The third category, the person has sincere intention because he believes that I'm worshipping Allah because Allah Ta'ala deserves to be worshipped. The reason why he has sincere intention, the right intention, why? Because he has in his mind that I'm worshipping Allah because he's, he's deserving of my worship, or, or, or of my act of worship. He deserves to be worshipped. He deserves to be obeyed. He has that in his mind. So this is the highest of all the levels of intention. A person who worships Allah with that in mind, that Allah, I am worshipping you because you deserve to be worshipped. You are worthy of worship. You are worthy of being obeyed. So this is the highest station, scholars have said. So may Allah give us a tawfiq to be of, from, from the, of this, this category of people, from these categories of people, the last one. That we worship Allah because he deserves to be worshipped. He's worthy of wor being worshipped. He's worthy of um, being obeyed. Next slide, which is our last slide on, on this hadith. Benefits of the hadith, lessons from the hadith. So the slide where he says benefits of the hadith, lessons from the hadith. 
So, so what could we achieve from the hadith? Benefits of the hadith, having the right intention is the means of the action being accepted and entitled to receive great rewards. So benefit of having the right intention, firstly your action is accepted and you're rewarded by Allah. The second benefit is having the right intention helps one in doing an action properly and with greater importance. For example, if someone gives charity with sincerity, then he will make sure that the money he is donating is legit and from a halal source. Since he is doing it for Allah and Allah does not accept anything except that which is pure. Such an important point. So if you have sincere intention, then you'll make sure your action is proper. Because you really care about your action. You really want it to be accepted. You really want to receive the reward. That mentality will drive you towards doing your action properly. I use the example of charity. When it comes to you, when a, per, a sincere person wants to donate money to the masjid or any um, organization, then he'll make sure his money is from a halal source. So that is, he, meaning this, this, he will, he will, he would want his act, action to be up to perfection. He doesn't want to spoil this. It's such a great deed. He's, he's giving so much money. He wants 100% reward. So he will make sure that there is no deficiency shortcoming in his action. You can use it for any example. Thirdly, having the right intentions saves one from so many evil. One of them being Riyya, which is a grave sin, that which washes away our good deeds and its perpetrators are severely punished by Allah. So one of the greatest benefits of having sincere intention is that one is safe from so many evil, one of them being Riyya, the greatest one is being Riyya, meaning you do something to show others. This is Riyya, it's a grave sin, which we'll be covering later on. <clears throat> lessons from the Hadith. What are the lessons we can take from the Hadith? <clears throat> Whenever one performs a good action, he should be sincere in his intention and his sole purpose of doing the action should be to please Allah the Almighty. One should, <clears throat> one should long, second one, one should long for the greater reward, which is the reward in the hereafter, and distance oneself from the temporary and insignificant gains, which is of the worldly riches and temptations. In that way, one will always ensure that his, intention are, his intentions are intact. Third, a believer should always renew his intention in order to safeguard his actions from being ruined and wasted. So whenever we do any action, in between, we should check our intention. Who are we doing it for? For example, we're praying salah. In the middle, we should be, in between what should we be doing, we should be renewing our intention. Who are we? I'm praying salah. Who am I doing it for? Yeah. So we should check our intentions all throughout the action. And we should renew our intention. The last one, a believer's day-to-day -day life should be revolving around the worship and the remembrance of Allah, the Almighty, and that could be, that could only be achieved when his intentions are associated with the right intention. When his actions are associated with the right intention. In this way, he is not only being rewarded for his daily worship, but also rewarded for his daily habits and necessities of life that are accompanied by intention. So this is the main purpose. Our Sharia is so beautiful, so perfect, that it's so easy to um, perform a good deed. You can easily transform a daily habits, you know, which we cannot avoid, we cannot survive without. But these very um, acts, the habits and necessities of life, we can transform it into act of worship, just by making intention. Hadith number two, hadith of Jibreel a very lengthy hadith. I'll just read out the translation. 
Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, while we were one day sitting with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa there appeared before us a man dressed in extremely white clothes and with very black, um, very black hair. No traces of journeying were visible on him and none of us knew him. He sat down close by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, rested his knees against the knees of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and placed his palms over his thighs. He said, O Muhammad, inform me about Islam. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, Islam is that you should testify that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That you should perform salah, pay zakat, fast during the month of Ramadan and perform hajj if you can find a way to. He said, you have spoken the truth. We were astonished at this that he questions him and then he tells him that he was right. He then went on to say, inform me about faith. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered, is that you believe in Allah and his angels and his books and his messengers and in the last day and in fate, both in his good and in his evil aspects. He said, you have spoken the truth. Then the man said, inform me about Ihsan. He sallallahu alayhi wa answered, is that you should serve Allah as though you could see him. If you cannot see him, then he certainly sees you. He said, inform me about the hour. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, the one question knows no more than the questioner. So he said, well, inform me about his signs. He said, they are, they are that the slave girl will give birth to her mistress and that you will see the barefooted ones, the naked, the destitute, the herdsmen of the sheep competing with each other in raising lofty buildings. Thereupon the man went off. I, await, I waited a while and then the Prophet وسلم, said, Oh Umar, do you know who, who that? Question I was, I replied, Allah and His Messenger know better. He said that was Jibrail alayhi salam. He came to teach you your religion, Sahih Muslim. Now, this hadith is a very lengthy hadith full of benefits, one of the most beneficial and one of the most comprehensive hadiths. It's a complete package. In this hadith, you can learn about your aqidah, you can know about your practical actions, you, you know about the, some of the signs of the last hour, and it's a great treasure for the students of knowledge. Mannerism, etiquette, so much you can learn. Scholars have called this hadith the mother of all the hadith. Scholars have called this hadith the mother of all the hadith. Just as the way Surah Fatiha is the mother of the Quran because of its comprehensiveness. Similarly, Surah Fatiha, full of meanings, covers all the aspects, aqidah, so much. The similarly is this hadith. So this is, a, so this is the comparison. The way Surah Fatiha is the mother of all the surahs, mother of the Quran. Similarly, this hadith is the mother of all the hadith. Hadith, while we were one day sitting with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there appeared before us a man dressed in extremely white clothes and with very black hair. No traces of journey were visible on him and none of us knew him. So we will just do the commentary of, um, we'll just do this slide and we'll finish the lesson and we'll um, resume next lesson. We'll um, continue from where we left off next lesson. We'll just finish this slide, inshallah. Commentary. What Umar radiallahu ta'ala meant was that the strange person who appeared
The strange person who appeared didn't have no signs of a traveler in his appearance, as travelers normally look disheveled and dirty because of long journey. So, <clears throat> secondly, since he didn't look like a traveler to more of the Allah and his surroundings, he must have been someone who lived nearby, but that was neither the case because no one knew him. So many strange things happen in this hadith. Firstly, the strange man coming from nowhere and then asking questions and his appearance and the way he was acting, you know, that baffled all the Sahaba. They didn't know what was going on. So firstly, no one knew him. No. So if no one knows him, then that means he's a traveler. But then, if he's a traveler, there are no, there should be signs and traces of a traveler. Meaning if travelers back in the days, you know, um, the, the traces of, of traveling they were apparent on the people, but he didn't have no traces. In fact, it was the opposite. He was, he was clean. His white was, his clothes was very white. So that's what confused the Sahaba. Jibreel Salam disguised, disguising himself as the strange person in the incident wore white clothes, which were extremely white, indicates that students of knowledge should give importance to um, cleanliness and personal hygiene. So there's so much, as I've said, this, uh, this hadith is a great treasure for the student of knowledge. You can learn so much etiquette of knowledge from this hadith. So Jibreel Salam, he came with very white clothes. That indicates towards his clothes being very clean. <coughs> implying that students of knowledge should be very clean. When they attend any religious gathering, any circles of knowledge, they should be very clean. They should be wearing the best of clothes. <coughs> because they are, the students of knowledge are the guests of Allah. But the guests of Allah, they should, um, <coughs> they should act like a guest. When we go to any, um, um, any guest house, you know, we dress up very nicely, we learn, we are very clean, we wear the best clothes. This, we should have this, we have, we should give greater importance when it comes to attending any religious gathering because we are the guest of Allah. So firstly, that indicates to us personal hygiene. It also indicates that the students of sacred knowledge should prefer to wear, to wear white. White is a very is a very virtuous color. Rasulullah used to wear white. <coughs> In this hadith, you can see Jibreel wearing white. The students of knowledge, they should be wearing white. <laughs> Second point, him having very black hair indicates towards him, uh, towards him being of younger age. Because white people, they don't have, the old people don't have um, black hair. So him having black hair indicates that he was, he was of younger age. So that is indicating towards, <coughs> towards the fact that students of knowledge, when anyone wants to acquire knowledge, they should be young. This is when there's less distraction, your mind is fresh, and your memory is very strong. The important lesson, whenever you want to seek knowledge, any knowledge, whether you want to become a Hafiz, or, <clears throat> okay, alim, or when you want to become an Alim, you do it at a young age. If you do it when you're very young, because it's to do with memorization. Alim, you do it a bit later, because it's to do with understanding the Quran and Sunnah. It's to do with understanding fiqh, it's to do with understanding aqidah. You start a bit later, but still young age. You start alimiyah um, um, from teenage age, from 15, 16 onwards. This is the perfect, you're still young. And there's less distraction. You wouldn't, I'm sure 15, 16 year old don't have a family, don't have no commitments. So this is the best age. And half is the younger you are, the better he is. So this, the, the two points, one is personal hygiene, wearing the best of clothes when he goes to, um, when he comes to, uh, when you go to any religious gathering. Secondly, you know, your age, when it comes to seeking knowledge, you should be young. And also it depends on the subject. If you want to become a half is, the younger you are, the better he is. If you want to become an alim, then you have to be a bit mature because it's to do with understanding. But they all fall under 
the young age, one being young. So may Allah give us a tawfiq. If you have any questions, um, you can ask me um, in the on WhatsApp, inshallah. The next week we will resume from the next slide, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.